this is a study actually that um, we ha we started to work on um, about four years ago. So this is a major, major undertaking. And what we did was we went to the Alzheimer's disease research brain bank that uh, they have been collecting brains um, from patients with Alzheimer's disease and, um, and mild um, cognitive impairment going back to 1996. So we actually identified patients um, here in Rochester that, um, um, that had died and were pathologically confirmed to have high probability Alzheimer's disease. We identified 346 brains. We, what we did then was um, we took these brains and we shipped them, them down to the uh, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville um, um, laboratory of Dr. Dennis Dixon. And these um, brains essentially were then sectioned, which means that we, we, we sliced. We picked one region, the region that we think is probably affected first by the protein that um, we were interested in studying in Alzheimer's disease known as TDP43. So we sectioned the, the region of the brain known as the amygdala in these 300 and um, um, I think it was 342 because four we had to exclude. And these 342 cases were then immunostained. And what that means is we essentially were looking for this protein, so we apply this technique to see if the protein is present in this region or not, in the amygdala. And of these 342 cases, we were quite surprised that we found the protein to be present in 195 cases. So more than 50, 57% of these patients who had pathological confirmation of Alzheimer's disease showed um, or were positive for this, this other protein, TDP43. Now, the question is, well, is this protein just found in this one region, or is it extensive and throughout the brain? So for these 195 cases that were positive, we then sectioned 14 additional regions. So we had thousands of, of slides, essentially, that we were looking at. And we then sort of characterized where the protein is. Um, and finally, we wanted to determine how much protein um, was present, what we, what we refer to as the burden. And so we actually used an algorithm with a special computerized program that actually allowed us to detect how much of this protein was, was present. So first of all, that was very interesting is that Alzheimer's disease, as you know, um, since its um, discovery, I think in 1902 really, folks have been talking about two proteins, amyloid or beta amyloid and this other protein tau. And so pharmaceutical companies and researchers throughout the world have invested an enormous amount of time um, trying to figure out how can we prevent uh, these abnormal, these two abnormal proteins uh, from occurring or how can we destroy them. And so the, the thinking is if we can figure that out, well, we should be able to cure this devastating disease, Alzheimer's disease. But what about this third protein, TDP43? Now we know that TDP43 can, be, can cause problems in other conditions, for example, Lou Gehrig's disease, frontotemporal dementia. But, um, but what does it do in the presence of, of Alzheimer's disease? Is it doing anything? Is it insignificant? Or is it also playing a role similar to these two other proteins? And so in order to address that question, what we did was we looked at the patients so everyone in this study, the 342 patients, all had Alzheimer's disease pathologically confirmed. We then separated that group into two, two different groups. One group of patients that did not have this third protein, TDP43, and another group of patients that did have this um, <clears throat> protein, TDP43. And we then looked at markers um, of Alzheimer's disease, so memory loss, um, um, functional impairment, uh, which means essentially how well these patients can drive and pay their bills, etc. And we also had a very uh, specific marker, which is a, an MRI scan of, 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 the, of a region of the brain known as the hippocampus, which is the main memory structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. And we measured it. So the question is, um, well, do we find a difference in the group that has this third protein compared to the group that does not? And Surprisingly, we found that the group that had the protein, the, their brains were smaller, they tended to be more impaired cognitively, 
more fu um, f and functionally. So then it tells us that if we have two groups that have an equal amount of these two proteins and the only difference between these two groups is this third protein, TDP43, that that protein must also be important and must also be playing a role in what we see as physicians, memory loss, inability to drive, and pay your bills in, this, in, in Alzheimer's uh, disease. Now, um, what's interesting, I think one of the most interesting um, aspects of this study was that we found a group of patients that had Alzheimer's disease. So they, now this might get a little complicated here, they, they have Alzheimer's disease pathology. So it is Alzheimer's disease by definition. But when they died, they were normal. So they, 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 they did not have memory loss, they did not have this phenotype that we, we see, but still they had the protein in the brain. And what was interesting is that those patients did not have TDP43, which now makes you, you begin to wonder, well, do you need TDP43 actually to have the cognitive impairment, to have the memory loss? And that's one way to interpret the finding is that TDP is essential, it's important. Another interpretation though, because there were some patients that were impaired that did not have TDP43. So we need to turn to um, um, studies that have discussed what, what's known as resilient AD. And what we mean by that is we, we know that there are some patients that interestingly have Alzheimer's in their brain, yet they're, they're normal clinically. They don't, they don't come in with memory problems, they're fine. They're walking around essentially normal. Why is that? And, and so what we think is that for, for, for those patients, TDP43 cannot be present. In other words, even, you can have the Alzheimer's pathology, the two proteins, beta amyloid and tau, and you can still be normal. But when you throw in this third protein, TDP43, there's no way you're gonna be normal. And so I think to, 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 to put this into perspective, I think that the, the approach to the cure or the treatment of this devastating disease, I think must consider this third protein in their approach. Because if 57% if of patients, for argument's sake, have, have this protein, and let's say you, 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 you eliminate the, the, the other two proteins with whatever treatment we come up with, this third protein is still gonna be left, it's still gonna be there in 57% of the patients. So I think either we're gonna have to focus on all three proteins, but I don't think that we can, at this stage, ignore this third protein and its importance.